Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my full review of the Canon EOS 90D, an upper mid-range DSLR with a 32.5 megapixel APS-C sensor, 10 frames per second shooting, uncropped 4K video, and a fully articulated touchscreen. The successor to the popular EOS 80D costs $1,200 or pounds for the body alone, and with its faster speed makes you wonder if it's also a successor of sorts to the 7D Mark II. Certainly the days of new DSLRs are numbered, and with a typical 3 year lifespan for Canon's double digit models, I suspect the 90D may well be the last in its series. And if it isn't, they'll need to think of a new name for it, because there's already a 100D. In this video I'll show you everything that's new on the 90D, compare the features and performance, whether shooting through the optical viewfinder or in live view, and of course see what Canon's new 32.5 megapixel sensor is capable of. If you find any of this useful, don't forget you can support me with a like and a follow, or a coffee donation, see links to everything below. Thanks. Let's start with the body which looks a great deal like its predecessor, that's the 90D on the left, and the older 80D on the right. You'll need to look pretty closely to spot the differences. The controls on the top remain the same as the 80D before it, with the exceptions of different textures around the main mode dial on the left, and the finger dial on the right. So, as before, there's the lockable mode dial surrounded by a satisfyingly chunky power switch on the left side, while on the right are the finger dial, a backlit LCD information screen, and four buttons along the top to adjust the autofocus, drive, ISO, and metering modes. Notice how the ISO button has a small point in the middle to more easily identify it when you're composing through the viewfinder. Rounding it off is a soft touch shutter release. It's all essentially unchanged since the EOS 60D three generations and nine whole years ago, so owners of that model along with the 70D or 80D will feel right at home here. Round the back the controls again are very similar to the EOS 80D, starting with a collar by the viewfinder to select and enter live view for composing with the screen, or switch into the movie mode where the button in the middle now starts and stops recording. I've always been very fond of this control, and while its orientation has been rotated a little, the function and feel remain the same. The biggest difference over the ATD is the reinstatement of an AF joystick, a feature removed on the EOS 60D nine years ago to differentiate it from the new 7D series, and which remained absent on the 70D and 80D. Indeed, it's been gone so long, Canon has slyly pitched it as a new feature rather than one that was there until the 50D. So for a bit of nostalgia, here it is, present and correct, in my EOS 50D review, filmed in glorious standard definition a mere 11 years ago. Come on, who else has been filming reviews for you since 2006? Below the joystick is the thumb wheel with an 8-way rocker inside which, in a missed opportunity for customization, shares the function of the joystick. I also noticed the wheel felt a little less clicky and tactile than the one on the ATD, although you're unlikely to notice that unless you've got them side by side. As a DSLR, the 90D is of course equipped with an optical viewfinder with its own autofocus system. It's identical to the 80D in this regard, offering the same 100% coverage, 0.95 times magnification, and 45-point all cross-type autofocus system. The viewfinder AF modes are also the same, although the 90D can now exploit its more sophisticated metering sensor to offer basic face detection during composition, and I'll demonstrate how that works later. Like the 60, 70 and 80D before it, the 90D retains the side hinged fully articulated touchscreen beloved of anyone who shoots at high or low angles in either the landscape or portrait orientations, as well as flipping forward to face you for vlogging without blocking accessories mounted on the hot shoe, and of course it can also flip back on itself for protection. Sure it's an old feature which first made its appearance on the 60D in this series, but one that's found on disappointingly few cameras these days, so I'm pleased Canon stuck with it here. Interestingly, it also makes the 90D more desirable for serious vlogging than the M6 Mark II, whose vertically tilting screen becomes blocked by anything mounted on its hot shoe, like a microphone. Canon's touch features remain unchanged, but are worth mentioning when rivals like Sony continue to severely underuse the facility. So, along with tapping to reposition the AF area in live view and movies, you can tap your way through the quick and main menu systems, as well as swiping and playback, although you can of course use the physical controls if you prefer. On the left side you'll find all the ports behind several flaps. Unlike the M6 Mark II, Canon's chosen to stick with micro USB here rather than USB-C, and as you probably suspected, you sadly can't charge the 90D's battery internally over USB. There's also mini HDMI with 8-bit 422 output, a port for a cabled remote, and 3.5mm jacks for both microphones and headphones, again cementing its position as a decent camera for video. 
Note the M6 Mark II also has a microphone input, but sadly no headphone jack, although that model can at least be charged over its USB-C port, so long as the charger supports power delivery. Open the flap on the grip side and you'll find the single SD card slot. Sadly, but again unsurprisingly, Canon has continued to resist fitting twin card slots to maintain the differentiation with the single digit Pro bodies. Contrast it with Nikon that's been fitting twin card slots to mid-range DSLRs for ages. The 90D is powered by the LP E6N battery pack which claims up to 1300 shots when shooting through the optical viewfinder alone. This is a key benefit that DSLRs still have over more battery hungry mirrorless cameras, although switch the 90D into live view and of course the battery life reduces considerably. In terms of video shooting I managed to record over 4 hours worth of 1080 footage or 3 hours worth of uncropped 4K per charge which is pretty good and comfortably more than the M6 tool manage while also avoiding overheating unless you're filming in the cropped 4K mode as I'll explain in a moment. When shooting through the viewfinder, the 90D offers bursts up to 10 frames per second with continuous autofocus, a respectable boost over the 7 frames per second of the 80D before it, and matching the speed of the 7D Mark II, in theory allowing it to be considered for more serious sports, action and wildlife photography. You can see the 45 point AF system here in action when the viewfinder custom AF mode is set to 2 where it ignores face detection from the metering and relies on the basic autofocus algorithms which sometimes find me and sometimes don't. Now here I am again but this time with the viewfinder custom menu set to 0 which enables Canon's new ITR face tracking. This actually exploits the high resolution metering sensor that's used when you compose through the viewfinder to recognize faces and drive the 45 point AF system to follow them, as long as the face falls within the lozenge shaped viewfinder autofocus array of course. I'd say it's doing a visibly better job at tracking me here than the previous mode did, although a third option combines both face and normal subject tracking so it's always worth experimenting to see which one works best for your particular situation. When shooting with the screen in live view, the 90D uses Canon's latest dual pixel CMOS AF for quick and confident refocusing, now supporting face and eye detection in continuous servo AF across virtually the entire frame. There's the choice of two shutter types in live view with burst shooting, and this is the electronic front curtain option, which fires at 7 frames per second with continuous servo AF, or 11 frames per second with fixed focus. Now for the fully mechanical shutter option which also shoots at 7 frames per second with servo continuous AF or 11 with fixed focus, although more noisily and with greater potential vibration which could potentially introduce some shutter shock. Now apart from increased volume I didn't personally notice any downsides to shooting in live view with a mechanical shutter but again it's worth experimenting to find which mode works best for you in different situations. When shooting action, the 90D is a tale of two autofocus systems with quite different capabilities. They both share the same buffer though, which in my tests gave me around 35 JPEGs or 12 RAW files at the top speeds before slowing down. Canon actually quotes higher figures of 58 JPEGs or 25 RAWs, so your mileage may vary. Assuming a figure somewhere within this range though, you'll only be able to shoot JPEGs for 3-5 to five seconds at the top speed before the camera slows or stalls. Compare that to the 90 or so JPEGs I could shoot with the 7D Mark II at the same speed of 10 frames per second. Starting with the viewfinder AF system, here's a sequence showing Ben cycling towards me using the EFS 18-135 at 135mm f5.6 where several of the frames are not completely sharp. I had the same experience whether using single, zoned or the full AF array. Now for the same test but in live view where the 90D may shoot more slowly at 7 frames per second with continuous autofocus but it delivered a far higher hit rate of focused images. Now for some bursts of Brighton Seagulls using the EF 70-200mm f2.8 L mostly at 200mm f2.8 where I found the 90D's viewfinder autofocus system proved quite hit and miss. Sometimes it'd deliver nice crisp results but at other times it just seemed overwhelmed by the speed of the birds and just couldn't keep up. I repeated the test with different autofocus areas and settings across several days and lighting conditions but just found the 90D's viewfinder AF system wasn't that well suited to birds in flight. To be fair it's no worse than the EOS 80D but equally no improvement on it in this regard. 
I wish Canon had equipped the 90D with a 7D Mark II's more effective 63-point viewfinder autofocus system, which in my tests on that camera fared much better with birds in flight. I mean, it's not like the 7D Mark II is a brand new camera they're trying to protect, and indeed I wonder if they'll even ever update that series. Now switching to live view on the 90D delivered a far more confident performance for autofocus with the birds, but it's really hard to aim a DSLR with a long lens when using the screen alone. In fact, it's almost impossible to photograph birds in flight without a viewfinder. And that's the ironic thing about the 90D. It does have a viewfinder, but its best autofocus system is during live view when you can only use the screen. At this point, I have to mention the M6 Mark II, which shares the same sensor, but as a mirrorless camera is always in live view, allowing you to use the screen or the viewfinder with the same dual pixel autofocus system. The M6 II also shoots much faster than the 90D at 14 frames per second while maintaining confident autofocus. And it also offers a raw burst mode, which captures 30 frames per second burst with a half second pre-buffer, a feature that's strangely absent on the 90D's live view menu. So in a surprise move, the M6 Mark II is actually more compelling than the 90D for sports, action and birds in flight, as long as you fit its optional viewfinder accessory. But then in an even stranger twist of fate, the 90D becomes preferable to the M6 II for video and even vlogging, but more about that in just a minute. Staying with shutter types for just a moment, when set to its mechanical shutter, the 90D's top speed is 8,000th of a second, the same as the 80D before it, but notably double that of any Canon mirrorless camera. Set the camera to live view and you have the choice of three shutter types, mechanical, electronic front curtain and, so long as you're not shooting bursts, fully electronic. The fully electronic shutter operates in genuine silence, something the ATD in early models couldn't do, and unlocks faster speeds of up to 16,000th of a second. Now it's the same as the M62 in the same mode, although like the majority of cameras it does come with some caveats. Firstly, in Canon's world, you won't be shooting bursts with a fully electronic shutter. Secondly, you have to be careful of moving subjects or moving the camera as it can result in skewing due to rolling shutter. To illustrate this effect, here's a shot I took with the 90D's mechanical shutter while panning the camera from left to right, and as you'd expect, the tower in the distance remains a vertical line. But now here's the same shot taken with the electronic shutter while panning the camera at the same speed, and you can clearly see the skewing effect. Now to be fair, this affects virtually all electronic shutter modes, but it's something to be aware of. Like most Canon cameras, there's a handy bulb timer for easily deploying long exposures without accessories. Simply enter bulb mode, then choose how long you'd like the shutter to stay open for from the menus. I set a 120 second timer for this long exposure of Brighton's West Pier after sunset, and if you'd like to learn more about this fun technique, check out my separate long exposure tutorial which explains everything you need to know. My in-camera book also has loads of long exposure tips and examples, and you can find a link to it in the description and pinned comment below. The EOS 90D is also equipped with focus bracketing, which fires a burst electronically in live view, focusing further away with each shot. You can then stack these in software later to increase the effective depth of field. Here's an example of the capture process I shot using the M6 Mark II, which works in exactly the same way. And now here's the final stacked image I made with Helicon Focus, which in this particular case was more successful for me than using Canon's supplied DPP software. Now for video, set the video system to PAL and the 90D can film 720 at 50p, 1080 at 25 or 50p, or 4K at 25p, all uncropped and using IPB compression with data rates of around 30 megabits per second for 1080 or 120 megabits per second for 4K. Switch the video system to NTSC and you can film 720 at 60p, 1080 at 30 or 60p, or 4K at 30p. So like most recent Canon cameras, there's no 24p in any mode and no explanation as to where it's gone. ATD owners will also notice the choice of IPB, or the milder all eye compression has gone and it's only IPB compression here. The big news though is the 90D and M62 become Canon's first interchangeable lens cameras to support uncropped 4K video and I'm pleased to report with dual pixel autofocus too. Remember the ATD had no 4K at all. Here's a clip I filmed with the EOS 90D filming in 1080 at 25p where it uses the full sensor width. All of my clips are straight out of camera in the standard profile. And now the same subject when filming in 4K, again using the uncropped mode at 25p. 
So far, so similar to the M62, but the 90D also offers a 4K crop mode that's lacking on the M62, seen here using the same lens focal length. Obviously, this results in a reduction in the field of view, which is bad news if you want wide coverage, although good news if you want extra reach. But there's also a quality benefit over the uncropped mode, as I'll now illustrate. So here I've pictured uncropped 4K in the top half of the screen and cropped 4K in the bottom half with the lens adjusted to match the field of view. If you're watching this in 4K on a 4K display, I'd say the difference is clear with the cropped version looking more detailed, but I'll show it again with the resolution chart next. So in this more formal comparison, I've filmed a standard resolution chart in all of the modes and with a variety of bodies for comparison. First, here's the older 80D in uncropped 1080 in the top half, with uncropped 1080 from the 90D in the bottom half to show you how Canon's sensor and processing has changed in the last three years. I'd say 1080 footage looks a little more detailed on the new 90D over its predecessor, so that's good news. Now I've switched out the 80D and replaced it with uncropped 4K footage from the EOS 90D in the top half, leaving uncropped 1080p from the 90D in the lower half. You can clearly see here how 4K is delivering finer detail than the 1080 footage as you'd expect, but perhaps not by as much as you hoped. Next, I've kept uncropped 4K from the 90D in the top half, but you're now looking at the 4K crop mode in the bottom half with the lens adjusted to match the field of view. And again, if you're viewing on a 4K display, you'll see the crop mode is visibly superior, giving the 90D a benefit in potential video quality over the M62, which sadly and strangely lacks a 4K crop option. Although again, the crop mode will of course reduce the field of view and does come with some overheating issues I'll discuss in a moment. But what about compared to the competition? I've kept the 90D's cropped 4K footage in the bottom half and switched in 4K from the Sony A6400 in the top half, which at 24 and 25p uses the full sensor width without any cropping. Clearly the Sony A6400 is keeping up with the cropped 4K mode on the 90D, but without any cropping and it exceeds the detail of the 90D's uncropped mode. While the uncropped 4K footage may not be as detailed as the best of its rivals, there's no arguing with Canon's dual pixel autofocus seen here effortlessly pulling focus between the can and the background using the touchscreen. I use the EFS 18-135mm here, but the camera is equally happy to focus with much shallower depth of field lenses. The combination of confident dual pixel autofocus and effective face detection, now further enhanced by eye detection, means the 90D is very good at keeping you in focus wherever you are in the frame. I filmed this using the 18-135mm kit zoom. The eye detection may not work as far away as Sony's does, but you should still experience few if any issues with focusing. For an additional challenge, I filmed this again using the EF 50mm f1.8 STM at f1.8, and this time the relatively leisurely focusing speed of this particular lens means it doesn't always keep up with my movements, but if you're filming a piece to camera with more modest motion, you can be confident you'll stay sharp most of the time. It all adds up to a camera that's also very well suited to vlogging, as I'll now demonstrate. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is a quick vlogging test with a Canon EOS 90D filming in 4K at 25p with the enhanced stabilization mode in addition to the optical stabilization in the lens. And the lens I'm using is the 10 to 18 millimeter at 10 millimeter f4.5. I'm also recording the audio with the Rode Wireless Go. You can see the transmitter here. So really this is a best case scenario. All of the technologies working together, hopefully for a nice result. But if you're wondering what the other stabilization modes and the 1080 quality looks like for vlogging, then check out my separate detailed vlogging video. I didn't think that I would bore you to death with all the settings in this main review. So check out that separate one if you're interested. Meanwhile, stick along with this one and I'll tell you more about the camera. Moving on, the 90D allows high-speed 1080 video at 100 or 120 frames per second, which is slowed in camera by four times. There's no sound recorded though, nor any auto-focusing during the clip, both of which are allowed by Sony. Fujifilm's latest cameras can also auto-focus high-speed video. Here's a couple of clips I filmed using the slow motion mode, and if you're careful about the action not moving too much towards or away from you, the lack of autofocus may not be a big issue. But if you do want autofocus with your slow motion, go for Sony or Fujifilm, and if you want sound as well, well, Sony's the only game in town. In terms of maximum recording times, the 90D can record clips lasting up to a second shy of half an hour in 1080 or 4K. In my tests, I managed to record almost four and a half hours worth of 1080 on a single charge across nine clips, while in uncropped 4K, a full battery got me just over three hours worth across seven clips. 
In both cases, there were no overheating issues, although the cropped 4K mode was a different matter, with the camera shutting itself down only 9 minutes into my second clip, so that's less than 40 minutes worth in total. Now there was plenty of battery life remaining, but the 90D insisted on cooling down for several minutes despite it feeling barely warm. To be fair, the half hour clip length on the 90D is way longer than the Fujifilm X-T30, which only allows a mere 15 minutes at 1080 or just 10 minutes of 4K at a time. But contrast them both with the Sony a6400, which has unlimited recording clips, so that's way beyond half an hour and it seems just fine about getting hot under the collar. I recorded a single 4K clip lasting just over an hour in my test, although the body felt pretty hot afterwards. Finally, for this video section, a test for rolling shutter, which here in 4K is actually pretty well behaved compared to many cameras. Sure, the tower is skewing with the fastest motion, but now compare it to the Sony a6400, sadly one of the worst offenders for rolling shutter, and you can see the 90D and the M62 sensor is actually pretty good in this regard. The headline feature of the 90D, along with the M62 mirrorless launched alongside it, is the debut of the highest resolution APS-C sensor to date, sporting 32.5 megapixels. This comfortably beats the 24 megapixel average for APS-C and the 26 of Fujifilm's latest generation. Canon unsurprisingly continues to neglect built-in stabilisation on either of its two new bodies, although to be fair, it's mostly only Micro Four Thirds cameras that offer it at this price point or lower. So, to iron out any wobbles with the 90D, you'll need lenses with optical stabilisation, and in Canon's world, that means going for models with IS in the title. As a Canon DSLR, the EOS 90D is of course equipped with an EF mount, and as an APS-C model, it's also compatible with EFS lenses. Now, it's easy to just brush past this feature, but the EF mount gives Canon DSLRs access to not only one of the broadest lens catalogues available, but also one of the biggest markets for third-party and second-hand models. Whatever the focal length you want, whatever your budget, there will be multiple options available, including new and used, and this is a key benefit of Canon DSLRs. The most common general purpose zoom for the 90D is the same lens introduced with the 80D three years earlier, the EFS 18-135mm f3.5-5.6 IS USM, which offers a broad 27-216mm equivalent range, image stabilisation, and fast and quiet nano USM focusing that's equally suited to shooting bursts or filming movies. Canon fans may also recall it's the only lens to support the optional accessory that motorises the zoom, and they tell me it still works on the 90D. The new sensor captures images with 6960 by 4640 pixels, compared to 6000 by 4000 on the earlier 24 megapixel models. This lets you make 23 by 15 inch prints at 300 dpi, that's 3 inches wider than you can at 24 megapixels, or of course gives you more latitude for cropping, which is great if you're photographing distant subjects like wildlife. Remember the finer pixel pitch will place greater demands on lenses though, so for the best result, couple the 90D with the best lenses you can afford. Ok, now for a selection of JPEG photos straight out of the 90D, mostly fitted with the EFS 18-135mm kit zoom. While the M62 really needed a better option than its own 15-45mm kit zoom to exploit the potential resolution, the EFS 18-135 does a much better job on the 90D. Sure, it's still not the sharpest tool in the box, of course, but it's not bad at all, while also delivering a useful general purpose range, as well as quick and quiet focusing that, again, is equally suited to action and movies. As for the images, I've always been fond of Canon's processing, which here is again delivering attractive, natural looking tones and colours. If you want a close look at any of these sample images, head over to my 90D review at Cameralabs.com. But how does the new sensor compare to the older 24 megapixel model? To find out, I photographed these flowers with the older EOS 80D, followed by the EOS 90D at all sensitivities and using the same EFS 18-135 lens. I then cropped the area marked by the red rectangle here for direct comparison. You're looking at the crops from the 80D on the left with its 24 megapixel sensor and the 90D on the right with its 32.5 megapixel sensor. These are JPEGs straight out of camera as Adobe hadn't yet supported the 90D RAW files at the time I made this review. Again, check Cameralabs.com for any updates. In this sequence, you can see the 90D crops on the right, delivering a little extra detail, but perhaps not as much as you expected. In terms of noise at the pixel level, both cameras are fairly similar here. To more formally compare the resolution, I photographed a standard test chart with both the EOS 80D and EOS 90D, each fitted with the EF 50mm 1.8 STM close to f5.6 for the best results. I've cropped the 80D result on the bottom, 
and the 90 degree resort on the top where its increase in resolving power is clearer but again maybe by not as much as you expected so canon's new 32.5 megapixel sensor is delivering the highest potential resolution from aps-c although you'll need a quality lens to enjoy the benefits Oh, and in terms of dynamic range, I'm waiting for full raw support from Adobe to be consistent with my other tests. I'll update my review at Camelabs.com when I have more results to share. And now, for my final verdict. The EOS 90D becomes Canon's most powerful mid-range DSLR to date, inheriting the body, sight hinge screen, optical viewfinder and 45-point autofocus of the earlier 80D, while upgrading the sensor resolution to 32.5 megapixels, offering uncropped 4K video at 25 or 30p, faster burst shooting at 10 frames per second to match the 7D Mark II, and reinstating the AF joystick which went missing on the three previous models in the series. As such, this upgrades whether you shoot still photos, film video, or like most owners of this series, do both. The image quality, as you've seen, certainly has the potential to beat 24 megapixel models, but not by a huge margin, and crucially only when fitted with a quality lens. In terms of video, it's great to finally enjoy uncropped 4K with dual pixel autofocus on an EOS body, but while it definitely resolves more detail than 1080 footage, the uncropped mode is not as detailed as 4K from the best of its rivals, most notably the Sony A6400 and Fujifilm X-T30. The optional cropped 4K mode delivers a much sharper image though due to the way Canon wrangles its pixels, but of course this reduces the field of view and more susceptible to overheating too. More than making up for these restrictions for most people though is the sheer success with which dual pixel autofocus can keep a subject in focus. On paper, the increase in speed and presence of an AF joystick means the 90D could be seen as a 7D Mark II successor of sorts, but buyer beware. The body is not as tough, it lacks the dual card slots, the buffer's not as big, and crucially, the 90D's 45-point viewfinder autofocus system is not a patch on the 63-point system on the 7D Mark II. In my test, delivering fairly lackluster performance when photographing birds in flight with the viewfinder. Switch to live view and the 90D's autofocus becomes much better, but the speed falls to 7 frames per second and it's almost impossible to aim a long lens for fast action using the screen alone. This is something the M62 does much better, allowing you to enjoy its even faster 14 frames per second bursts and best autofocus system with the screen or optional electronic viewfinder. So, Canon bird photographers should go for the M62 over the 90D and also keep an eye open for deals on the older 7D Mark II. But the tables are turned for video. Sure, there's no sign of the 24p or all-eye compression from the 80D, but with the choice of cropped or uncropped 4K with dual pixel autofocus, microphone and headphone jacks, long battery life, front-facing built-in microphones, and a flip screen that isn't obstructed by hot shoe accessories, the 90D actually becomes Canon's best mid-range camera for video and vlogging, whether you're looking at a DSLR or mirrorless model. Overall, I enjoyed shooting with the 90D, although again was struck by how much better it focused in live view than it did with the viewfinder. Had Canon equipped the 90D with the 7D Mark II's viewfinder autofocus system, it could have been a very different story, but as it stands you should carefully consider your usage when choosing between it and the M62, which is actually cheaper even in a kit with its electronic viewfinder. Indeed, despite my love for side hinge screens, I'd personally go for the M62 over the 90D, for my own use anyway. With the launch of each new DSLR, I also wonder if it will be the last in the series. There's typically three years between Canon's double-digit EOS DSLRs, so will there even be a market for an upgrade in 2022? And with the 100D already in the catalogue, what would they even call it? But for now, the upgrades across the board allow the 90D and DSLRs to remain relevant and compelling to those who prefer their larger form factor and optical viewfinder to smaller mirrorless cameras with all electronic composition. It's especially tempting for 60 or 70D owners who want a bunch of upgrades but without changing the look and feel of their bodies. I think it will be a successful camera for Canon, but possibly the last of its series. What do you think? Right, that's it for this video. I hope you found it useful. As always, if you did, you can support my channel with a like and a follow. And if you really like what I do, you can treat me to a coffee or treat yourself to my own camera book or a Camera Labs t-shirt. I've got links for all of this as well as checking prices on the 90D in the description and pinned comment below. As always, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of the 90D in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye.